Thank you very much. I'm very excited uh, to be here in Oakland uh, for so many reasons. One is I got a chance to see what my uh, workers have been doing, and I've gotten such <coughs> tremendous feedback. Oh, you would have loved to have been in uh, the prison today. Oh, those inmates. I mean, the compliments they made. And these are people who've gone through many programs. And they were telling us, okay, they, and they've only gone through the two-day core. What would happen if they went through the five-day or, or the 10-day we got for level one or the 15 for level two? I don't know what's gonna happen. They will be electing city council from jail. <laughs> Mrs. King spoke out here when Dr. King spoke at the UN in 1967 at the spring mobilization to end the war in Vietnam. And we marched from, what's the name of that park in New York? Central. Yes, Central Park, yes. Right, I knew, I just want to see if you remember. <laughs> Central Park. The march was so long, Reverend, until the rally was over before everybody got out of the park. <laughs> I'm reminded of that uh, great event because Martin Luther King was really convinced to take an outward stand against the war in Vietnam because of Coretta Scott King. She was the one that convinced him. He was against the war, but the question is whether you're gonna come out. Coming out is the issue. Because Martin Luther King had a lot of other issues he was already working on, okay? Mrs. King, that's what I'm talking about. You have to have people who are gonna help to uh, collaborate with you. And folks who are gonna help to bring you out. That's, that's why folks are here, because somebody helped to bring them out. Yeah. We need to find more bring them out people. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? That's what nonviolence is all about. Bringing the best out of others. And I look at the things happening in the world today. All the chaotic violence and everything else. But you know what? Hmm. We raised up a generation that's going to wipe it out. Listen, you can write this down in history. It's over. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's like all over. Yeah. Yes. When you talking about just two days of training on the inside of the prison, and they're talking about breaking out. They can't wait to get out so they can start putting together their nonviolent training program. These are folks who locked up. They locked up at even the doggone jail folk. I mean, I'm talking about the correctional officers, the captain. Pulled me aside, and that's why I couldn't get to the inmates. He giving me all these stories about the movement and how this thing has changed. He wasn't even supposed to be in the training. <laughs> he been eavesdropping. <laughs> now, I mean, if you can get that much eavesdropping, suppose he go to the training. And my point is, this stuff is like wildfire. I'm talking about not just a fire, but that wild stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all may not know that you know there's a piece of legislation in the uh, legislature in Colombia. Not Colombia, Colombia. Okay, yeah, Colombia. Okay, and 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 they uh, it's the calling for nonviolence to be put in every educational institution in the whole country. 
So what we're doing is talking about training folks in nonviolence like we train them in math. We've got to learn, as Martin Luther King said, to live together as brothers and sisters or we're going to die separately as fools. We can live in a, a more peaceful, nonviolent world community. We can do that. If we can figure out a way to go on the moon and, 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 and not talking about look at the man in the moon, no, be the man on the moon. If we can figure that out with our smart selves, how can we, why can't we figure out how we can keep our, somebody from blowing out our smart brains? We raise up a genius, okay? And then somebody come along and blow his brains or her brains out. We can solve this problem. We don't still need to be, you know, wallowing around in this thing. We have to put our minds together. Did you see what they're talking about? Training all of the high school student leaders so then they can go and train the others who are coming behind them. Uh, we don't need to have the ignorance that we have going around. Because we know too much. We have to organize it. I was working for the, um, what was it I was working for? Campus ministry. Uh, I was working out of St. Louis and, 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 and the teachers were going to go on strike. And what happened is that they didn't go on strike in the fall because the newspaper, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch was on strike. <laughs> so, right, and there was nobody would even know you're on strike, right? <laughs> so the media, of course, is very important. We know that from the movement, you know. So what happened is they waited, and by December the strike was over for the newspaper, and then the teachers went on strike. And there was a young girl who was the uh, president of her student body in, in, uh, in St. Louis, and, and she was uh, also captain of the basketball team, and, and school was closed, which meant you couldn't get transcript, you couldn't have any scouts coming, you know, the scout. So no, nobody was even getting ready to go to college. So uh, Julian Bond's uh, cousin, okay, <clears throat> Uh, she had been talking to Julian, and he told her to find me, because he knew I was in St. Louis, and I could help the students get back in school. So when she found me, I said, okay, all right. What I need you to do is round up all of the other student body presidents. So you can't help people unless they are able to organize themselves. That's the first thing, you see. If they can't do that, you can't help them. Because you can't do it for them. You can help people, okay, with a problem, but you can't solve their problem. So she did. Big, tall basketball player. She rounded them all up. I got there. First thing we did was had class. Teach you how to organize. So one of the first things you want to do is gather information and get some facts, okay? And we went down to the uh, court hearing because the thing was in court and, you know, the going back and forth. And the first thing we found out that there was no conflict between the school board and the teachers union. So well, why they were on strike? They were asking for a raise and for three years in a row they had been promised a raise and they didn't get it because there were snowstorms in St. Louis and they were unexpected and they weren't budgeted. So they didn't have a problem with giving the teachers money, it's just that they didn't have the money. So there was no conflict. We agreed that the teachers need a raise. We just don't have the money. So here the students are out on the streets because the school board doesn't have the money. So that's the first thing we found out. So in that case, what we had to do is educate the community. So I taught the students how to mobilize and organize a mass meeting. And they went all through the community, passing out leaflets and rounding up everybody. And then what we did was we got uh, 
this uh, 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 Evelyn Battle, and we got uh, Anita Bonds, the chairman of the school board and this teachers union, on the phone every morning because we didn't want them to be caught up in no fight with each other. You know, folks can take your words out of context and have you saying something that you don't even recognize. So we wanted them to stay, okay, on talking terms and saying the same thing. So there was no conflict. You get my point? We had the mass meeting, had them all talking together, okay? All right? Then we did what? We went and we found the corporate community. There was a group of corporate people in St. Louis. And they had their own little private, uh, like, chamber of commerce, the real wealthy ones. Not the regular chamber of commerce, but the high chamber. <laughs> there were two high groups in St. Louis. One was high from smoking, <laughs> and the other was high. <laughs> yeah. Right, that high group. <laughs> so we called them, and we said, uh, look, the school board doesn't have any problem with the money. They just don't have any. They're going to give it to the teachers. And you know what he said? He said, we don't get into labor management disputes. I said, this is not a labor management dispute. There's no dispute. They all agree that the teachers need money. So I told him, and sometimes we have to do that, Reverend. I said, I need you to check my record. You know how to check on folks? Like run, you know, uh-huh, the thing on paper? That's how I found out I'd been in jail 27 times. I got a policeman to run my record. I couldn't count that many times I was in jail. Yeah. One of the lieutenants told me that, okay? How many times I've been in jail? So I said, run my record so you can see that I'm not playing. I smile and I'm a nice, modest man, but I don't play. Don't get confused by that smile. <laughs> no, I don't play. I really don't, <laughs> okay? I said, told the students, our next move we're going to make is downtown. Because what we're going to do is we're going to take up barrels down in front of the bank. Because that's where the money is. Yeah. And we're going to take up a collection so the teachers can have their money and get back in school so the students can go back to school. We're going downtown where the money is. Our first move was on the library. Downtown public library. We had an all-night study in. Because our library was closed at school. So what we had to do is say, we need to catch up. So that's why we had to burn the midnight oil. So we had an all-night sit-in. And the newspaper was there, and the cameras were all over the place, and folks were writing this and the other, and guess what? The next morning, not one iota came in the newspaper. Nothing on television. As if they weren't there. That's power. That's power when you can do that. That's what called shutting down the freedom of speech. But that was a signal to me that they paid attention to you. Sometimes folks will pay attention to you when they keep their mouths closed. When they don't say anything, that's sometimes when they're paying attention. So we knew something was going on because they knew we were making our next move and he'd already checked my record. <laughs> so you know what happened? I got a phone call and he was flying over New Jersey in an airplane. You know, this was back in the 80s. Okay? Yeah, he didn't have all them cell phones and stuff like that. But he had one of them phones that you can fly, you talk on while you're in the air. And he called and told me, he said, well, we decided we got the problem solved. And there are several corporations that are going to put up the money. 
and give it to the school board. So that was wiped out. Students got back in school. We've got to help our young people learn how to respond to their problems. We've got to do that so they can be very effective. All right. What I have learned is that there is no problem that cannot be solved when you get the best minds together. It's putting your heads together. It's being able to understand how to take the differences among people. Well, let me just put it this way. Martin Luther King was what you call, he was a uh, Hegelian. Do you know Hegel? Yeah. Martin Luther King deliberately set up conflict. I saw him do it. <laughs> and Martin Luther King used to sit back. I saw him. He sat back in a staff meeting and didn't say a thing. Let folks go at it. And they did go at it. Okay? I'm telling you, you're talking about bumping heads. <laughs> they almost knocked each other's brains out. <laughs> yeah. So what happened is that Martin Luther King then would stand up at the end of the meeting where you had arguments on both sides. He would do what you call synthesize. And I used to sit back laughing. Because you know what he would say? He would tell, he, he would articulate that person's argument better than they did. And they say, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> and after he articulated both sides of the argument, then he synthesized by bringing out the best in each one of them. He was brilliant. So, you know, some folks like to hear what you got to say. So they can put up a debate against you. They're not paying attention to what you're saying. They're hearing something and they only hear a little bit of what you said and that's what they want to argue about. Oh, you see it on the news every night with the campaign. They're not interested in you know, really what you got to say. They're interested in how they can hear something that you can say that they can pounce on. Okay? And that's so pitiful and ignorant. I'm embarrassed. So you see, listening is more important. Hearing is an auditory function. But listening, okay, is much more than simply hearing. It's being able to understand. You know what understand is? You know what standing under is, don't you? Standing under somebody means that you're supporting them. You don't have to agree with them. You Do you understand? <laughs> huh? You don't have to agree with them, but you can support. There are folks in your family who you disagree with. But you got to support them. Yeah. Listen what the children are saying, and then you can help them. Okay? But if you don't listen to them, you can't help them. Well, Sam, we tell the children, shut up! I know what you did. But, but, but sh don't, hey, shut up. Because I'm going to whip you. Spatter rods, ball of chow. Uh uh. Thy rod and thy staff. <clears throat> Shall that's what we're talking about. That's what the rod was used for. Not to whip up on the little lambs, but to guide them back into the fold for safety. So talk to them. Listen. Because that's what you do anyway when they get big. <laughs> They do the same dumb things. And what you tell them? You too big to whip. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Listen to the children. Thank you very much. A couple of nights ago, uh, an 11-year-old boy was shot.
shot in his bed here in Oakland. How can the precepts of nonviolence bring a change in such a world today? All right. Uh, the first thing we have to do is close down the handgun manufacturing companies. And don't tell me what you can't do. Because if they got a boycott of the buses in Montgomery and change the system, there are about three states that make over 80% of the guns manufactured. Because if you can't have no gun, you can't shoot nobody. Well, they, one of them is North Carolina, I know that. They're back over there. Okay? But you can get these, one of these uh, young people right here, they can Google that for you in a minute. <laughs> we must stop making hand guns. We have just finished training 26,000 Nigerian, okay, militants in southern Nigeria. Those who were kidnapping people, those who were uh, blowing up oil pipes, and those were commandeering ships. We trained the leaders, the ones who were training people in camps how to be violent. We still have the camps. They're training them in nonviolence now. Mm, all right. Shell Oil started it, but what happened is it was so successful after we did the first 3,000, the government said, well, I'm going to offer an amnesty program. So if all my uh, young folk who've been shooting and killing up all our troops would agree to lay down your weapons and come into a camp where you can be trained in nonviolence, then what we'll do is give you additional trades, okay? Training, so you can have skills and you can do, be viable citizens, okay? 26,000. And they are right now in 24 countries being trained. They're in the United States, and in Texas, they're down there in, in West Palm Beach, Florida, and they got them coming to Atlanta, okay? They even have them in Johannesburg, South Africa, and guess what they're doing? Training them to be airplane pilots. Down there in Florida, underwater welders. Same ones. And who was that? Was that Dandy? Wasn't it Dandy who stood up and testified and said he'd killed 170 government troops? That's a bad dude. He, by himself, then killed 170. They were going back and forth with the violence, shooting and killing each other, okay? And there was a way we were able to transform that. I can't give you all the details, but I can tell you where we started. We started with the leaders who were in jail. So the first thing we got to do is find the leadership and we can solve this problem. What we have to do is put nonviolence into the curriculum in every school. Okay? What I want to do is get college students trained by college professors and then send those college students into the high schools to train the high school students and then get and give them credit for it you know give them some credit hours okay feet on the ground okay you can call it cognitive education you know what cognitive is well you know what cognitive is cognitive is putting your brain into action not just putting it on paper okay Conative. Get out there and do it. That's where education comes from, okay? Causing other folks to learn. So what happened is that uh, we can institutionalize it like Martin Luther King said that he wanted to do, and it's over. It's over once we institutionalize it. Okay. Now, why do folks go around shooting people? Why do they go around bullying people and all that? Because they're scared. The only reason why policemen shoot folk and kill them because they're scared. Now, they might have a good reason to be scared. But my point is, we need to find another approach to dealing with deviance. And the first thing we got to do is, like, you know, in California, stop killing folk 
talking about you against killing. How are you going to electrocute somebody and talk about you against killing? Martin Luther King says you can murder a murderer, but you can't murder murder.
the wake of the Rodney King murder. And what we saw was how those peace efforts were undermined, particularly by, by the police state. Law enforcement undermined those efforts. They were the ones who felt scared and threatened. We know that this is much more you know, nonviolence and, 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 and there's stakeholders in violence. It's about social control, it's about power, it's about maintaining hegemony. My question is, is how do we maintain, how do we navigate these systems, how do we maintain this momentum, this unique opportunity we have with the inmates of Pelican Bay so that what happened in 1993 doesn't occur again? That's the one about the prison in the different gangs. That's exactly what we did in Colombia, in Bella Vista. They were killing folk. Okay? Six a day. So what happened was, we brought the gang leaders together, because they had what they called a round table, kind of a talking table. Leaders from every one of the groups in jail. And we said, how many of y'all would like to stop the killing? See, you got to get people to agree. So my point is, we started the training. And I, the last time I cried was when I was in jail, OK? And I'm sitting down here looking at them doing their exercise, and they're planning their presentations to us, OK? Like in our, our training, we do and have people do presentations. And here was a guy who uh, would be ordinarily killing the other one, two right-hand men up there, sitting up there, planning the non-violent presentation to us. Mm. You've got to start with the top. Corrections. Who's at the top? Okay? And then you've got to negotiate. The only reason we were able to train those folks in uh, Nigeria, we had to go to the jail, the prison, okay, and get permission from the leaders. So the only way you got those guys from those different gang groups to get together is because of the leaders. Leadership is a key to it. Okay? And then the only thing you're trying to do now is get leadership to talk. So you got to get some folks now in there talking to the law enforcement folk. Violence is a language of the inarticulate. <laughs> You got to have some folks can talk now. Most riots happen because of the response, no, not response, reaction by the police. Most riots. They don't, if they're not trained how to respond effectively, then we will always have that. It doesn't take but one or two policemen to do it. Policeman is the only one out of everybody and every law enforcement, every combat person, whatever, that has the legal authority to be the judge and the jury and the executor without any other consultation. Because that policeman feels, and he's saying that it's got to be, feel that a life is in danger, is authorized by law to take a life. That's who needs to be trained. But you got to get the agreement from the top. Now, how do you do that? Hey, just like you get your roads paved and your schools done, okay, and your lights, your school voting. You're not going to change anything at the top until you are able to get the constituency to, to give direction to the elected officials. We had training in Providence, Rhode Island, of the entire police department. In Miami, Florida, I just told you, the entire county. Okay? All the county policemen. All right? That's what's needed here. You need to put Okay, your forces in play to get the law enforcement to go through the nonviolence training. Some of y'all gotta hurry up and get certified so you can help with the training. You get my point? At the city council meeting the other night, um, Alan Rupert, one of our young people, was shot by the police. Police report still not given to the family, all kinds of um, a 
injustice around the entire case. And in the city council meeting, people were frustrated, enraged, angry. And the next item on the agenda was to um, introduce um, a possible resolution for open to be named the Internet uh, what, uh, an International City of Peace. <laughs> situation with a young person being killed and how do you get, what do you do in response to that? Same thing with the Trayvon, okay, Martin situation in Florida, okay, you need to mobilize a coalition, you got to have an organization. This can't have loose folks going around uh, complaining and picketing. No, you bring together the leaders or the representatives from these different church organizations, women's organizations. In other words, if you have no women groups involved, you ain't got no women. <laughs> oh, you know about the Montgomery boycott? Mm -hmm. Well, they decided to have a one-day boycott on December 5th. Because uh, Rosa Parks was uh, arrested on December 1st. They got together and said, we need to boycott these buses. So they had no, uh, December 5th was the boycott. And they were going to wait to see how many folks participated in the boycott and how many empty buses they had. In the meantime, Joanne Robinson, the professor at Alabama State University, went and started cranking out compliance, telling people the boycott was going to continue. She had a women's political organization. By the time the men met, okay? All right? <laughs> you got to have these women involved, okay? And these groups. And the next thing you have to be able to do is demand a hearing. You got to make sure that you have a voice. That they understand that they represent you. And if they don't represent you, then you have to get someone who will represent you. This is a representative government. People don't speak for themselves. They are not elected to be individual uh, decision makers. They are simply to reflect what you expect. In other words, uh, you've got to inspect what you expect when you elect. <laughs> All right. I was a rapper too. That's what you elect the folks for. You're not just exercising your work. What you are exercising for? You need to be in the, the game. What's the point of exercise if you ain't going to get out there and play? Right here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.